More William Part 1 William awoke and rubbed his eyes. It was Christmas Day the day to which he had looked forward with mingled feelings for twelve months. It was a jolly day, of course presents and turkey and crackers and staying up late. On the other hand, there were generally too many relations about, too much was often expected of one, the curious taste displayed by people who gave one presents often marred one's pleasure. He looked round his bedroom expectantly. On the wall, just opposite his bed, was a large illustrated card hanging by a string from a nail a busy day is a happy day. That had not been there the day before. William hastily thought over the three aunts staying in the house, and put it down to Aunt Lucy. He looked at it with a doubtful frown. He distrusted the sentiment. A copy of Portraits of Our Kings and Queens he put aside as beneath contempt. Things a boy can do was more promising. Much more promising. After inspecting a penknife, a pocket compass, and a pencil box, which shared the fate of portraits of our kings and queens, William returned to things a boy can do. As he turned the pages, his face lit up. He leapt lightly out of bed and dressed. Then he began to arrange his own gifts to his family. For his father he had bought a bottle of highly colored sweets, for his elder brother Robert, aged nineteen, he had expended a vast sum of money on a copy of the Pirates of the Bloody Hand. These gifts had cost him much thought. The knowledge that his father never touched sweets, and that Robert professed scorn of pirate stories, had led him to hope that the recipients of his gifts would make no objection to the unobtrusive theft of them by their recent donor in the course of the next few days. For his grown-up sister Ethel he had bought a box of coloured chalks. That also might come in useful later. Funds now had been running low, but for his mother he had bought a small cream jug which, after fierce bargaining, the man had let him have at half price because it was cracked. Singing Christians awake at the top of his lusty young voice, he went along the landing, putting his gifts outside the doors of his family, and pausing to yell Happy Christmas as he did so. From within he was greeted in each case by muffled groans. He went downstairs into the hall, still singing. It was earlier than he thought just five o'clock. The maids were not down yet. He switched on lights recklessly, and discovered that he was not the only person in the hall. His four-year-old cousin Jimmy was sitting on the bottom step in an attitude of despondency, holding an empty tin. Jimmy's mother had influenza at home, and Jimmy and his small sister Barbara were in the happy position of spending Christmas with relations, but immune from parental or maternal interference. They've gotten out said Jimmy, sadly. I got them for presents yesterday, and they've gotten out. I've been feeling for them in the dark, but I cannot find them. What? said William. Snails. Great big huge ones with great big huge shells. I put them in a tin for presents and they've gotten out and I've gotten no presents for nobody. He relapsed into despondency. William surveyed the hall. They've got out right enough, he said, 
sternly. They've got out right enough. Just look at our hall. Just look at our clothes. They've got out right enough. Innumerable slimy shining trails shone over hats, and coats, and umbrellas, and walled paper. Her, grunted William, who was apt to overwork his phrases. They've got out right enough. He looked at the tracks again and brightened. Jimmy was frankly delighted. Oh! Look, he cried. Oh, funny. William's thoughts flew back to his bedroom wall. A busy day is a happy day. Let's clean it up, he said. Let's have it all nice and clean for when they come down. We'll be busy. You tell me if you feel happy when we've done. It might be true what it says, but I don't like the flowers messing all over it. Investigation in the kitchen provided them with a large pail of water and a scrubbing brush each. For a long time they worked in silence. They used plenty of water. When they had finished the trails were all gone. Each soaked garment on the hat stand was sending a steady drip onto the already flooded floor. The wall paper was sodden. With a feeling of blankness they realized that there was nothing else to clean. It was Jimmy who conceived the exquisite idea of dipping his brush in the bucket and sprinkling William with water. A scrubbing brush is in many ways almost as good as a hose. Each had a pail of ammunition. Each had a good-sized brush. During the next few minutes they experienced purest joy. Then William heard threatening movements above, and decided hastily that the battle must cease. Backstairs, he said shortly. Come on. Marking their track by a running stream of water, they crept up the backstairs. But two small boys soaked to the skin could not disclaim all knowledge of a flooded hall. William was calm and collected when confronted with a distracted mother. We was trying to clean up, he said. We found all snail marks and we was trying to clean up. We was trying to help. You said so last night, you know, when you was talking to me. You said to help. Well, I thought it was helping to try and clean up. You cannot clean up with water and not get wet not if you do it properly. You said to try and make Christmas Day happy for other folks and then I'd be happy. Well, I don't know as I'm very happy, he said, bitterly, but I've been working hard enough since early this morning. I've been working. He went on pathetically. His eye wandered to the notice on his wall. I've been busy all right, but it doesn't make me happy not just now, he added, with memories of the rapture of the fight. That certainly must be repeated some time. Buckets of water and scrubbing brushes. He wondered he'd never thought of that before. William's mother looked down at his dripping form. Did you get all that water with just cleaning up the snail marks? She said. William coughed and cleared his throat. Well, he said, shyly, most of it. I think I got most of it. If it wasn't Christmas Day, she went on darkly. William's spirits rose. There was certainly something to be said for Christmas Day.
It was decided to hide the traces of the crime as far as possible from William's father. It was felt and not without reason that William's father's feelings of respect for the sanctity of Christmas Day might be overcome by his feelings of paternal anger. Half an hour later William, dried, dressed, brushed, and subdued, descended the stairs as the bell sounded in a hall which was bare of hats and coats, and whose floor shone with cleanliness. And just to think, said William, despondently, that it's only just got to breakfast time. William's father was at the bottom of the stairs. William's father frankly disliked Christmas Day. Good morning, William, he said, and a happy Christmas, and I hope it's not too much to ask of you that on this relation infested day one's feelings may be harrowed by you as little as possible. And why do they think it necessary to wash the hall floor before breakfast? Heaven only knows. William coughed, a cough meant to be a polite mixture of greeting and deference. William's face was a study in holy innocence. His father glanced at him suspiciously. There were certain expressions of William's that he distrusted. William entered the dining room morosely. Jimmy's sister Barbara, a small bundle of curls and white frills, was already beginning her porridge. Good morning, she said, politely. Did you hear me cleaning my teeth? He crushed her with a glance. He sat eating in silence till everyone had come down, and Aunts Jane, Evangeline, and Lucy were consuming porridge with that mixture of festivity and solemnity that they felt the occasion demanded. Then Jimmy entered, radiant, with a tin in his hand. Got presents, he said, proudly. Got presents lots of presents. He deposited on Barbara's plate a worm which Barbara promptly threw at his face. Jimmy looked at her reproachfully and proceeded to Aunt Evangeline. Aunt Evangeline's gift was a centipede a live centipede that ran gaily off the tablecloth on to Aunt Evangeline's lap before anyone could stop it. With a yell that sent William's father to the library with his hands to his ears, Aunt Evangeline leapt to her chair and stood with her skirts held to her knees. Help! Help! she cried. The horrible boy! Catch it! Kill it! Jimmy gazed at her in amazement and Barbara looked with interest at Aunt Evangeline's long expanse of shin. My legs isn't like your legs, she said pleasantly and conversationally. My legs is knees. It was some time before order was restored, the centipede killed, and Jimmy's remaining gifts thrown out of the window. William looked across the table at Jimmy with respect in his eye. Jimmy, in spite of his youth, was an acquaintance worth cultivating. Jimmy was eating porridge unconcernedly. Aunt Evangeline had rushed from the room when the slaughter of the centipede had left the coast clear and refused to return. She carried on a conversation from the top of the stairs. When that horrible child has gone, I'll come. He may have insects concealed on his person. And someone's been dropping water all over these stairs. They're damp. Dear, dear, murmured Aunt Jane, sadly. Jimmy looked up from his porridge. 
How was I to know she didn't like insects? He said, aggrievedly. I like them. William's mother's despair was only tempered by the fact that this time William was not the culprit. To William also it was a novel sensation. He realized the advantages of a fellow criminal. After breakfast peace reigned. William's father went out for a walk with Robert. The aunts sat round the drawing room fire talking and knitting. In this consists the whole art and duty of being an aunt. All aunts do knitting. They had made careful inquiries about the time of the service. You needn't worry, had said William's mother. It's at 10.30. And if you go to get ready when the clock in the library strikes ten it will give you heaps of time. Peace, calm, quiet. Mrs. Brown and Ethel in the kitchen supervising the arrangements for the day. The aunts in the drawing room discussing over their knitting the terrible way in which their sisters had brought up their children. That also, is a necessary part of being an aunt. Time slipped by happily and peacefully. Then William's mother came into the drawing room. I thought you were going to church, she said. We are. The clock hasn't struck. But it's eleven o'clock. There was a gasp of dismay. The clock never struck. Indignantly they set off to the library. Peace and quiet reigned also in the library. On the floor sat William and Jimmy gazing with frowns of concentration at an open page of things a boy can do. Around them lay most indecently exposed the internal arrangements of the library clock. William, you wicked boy. William raised a frowning face. It's not put together right, he said. It's not been put together right all this time. We're making it right now. It must have wanted mending for ever so long. I don't know how it's been going at all. It's lucky we found it out. It's put together wrong. I guess it's made wrong. It's going to be a lot of trouble to us to put it right, and we cannot do much when you're all standing in the light. We're very busy working at trying to mend this old clock for you all. Clever, said Jimmy, admiringly. Mending the clock. Clever. William, groaned his mother, you've ruined the clock. What will your father say? Well, the cog wheels was wrong, said William doggedly. See? And this will isn't on properly not like what this book says it ought to be. Seems we've got to take it all to pieces to get it right. Seems to me the person what made this clock didn't know much about clock making. Seems to me. Be quiet, William. We was be quieting before you came in, said Jimmy, severely. You disturbed us. Leave it just as it is, William, said his mother. You don't understand said William with the excitement of the fanatic. The cog and the wheel ought to be put on the spindle different. See, this is the cog wheel. Well, it oughtn't to be like what it was. It was put on all wrong. Well, we was mending it. And we was doing it for you, he ended, bitterly just to help and to to make other folks happy.
It makes folks happy having clocks going right, anyone would think. But if you want your clocks put together wrong, I don't care. He picked up his book and walked proudly from the room followed by the admiring Jimmy. William, said Aunt Lucy patiently, as he passed, I don't want to say anything unkind, and I hope you won't remember all your life that you have completely spoilt this Christmas day for me. Oh, dear, murmured Aunt Jane, sadly. William, with a look before which she should have sunk into the earth, answered shortly that he didn't think he would. During the midday dinner the grown-ups, as is the foolish fashion of grown-ups, wasted much valuable time in the discussion of such futilities as the weather and the political state of the nation. Aunt Lucy was still suffering and aggrieved. I can go this evening, of course, she said, but it's not quite the same. The morning service is different. Yes, please, dear and stuffing. Yes, I'll have a little more turkey, too. And, of course, the vicar may not preach tonight. That makes such a difference. The gravy on the potatoes, please. It's almost the first Christmas I've not been in the morning. It seems quite to have spoilt the day for me. She bent on William a glance of gentle reproach. William was quite capable of meeting adequately that or any other glance but at present he was too busy for minor hostilities. He was extremely busy. He was doing his utmost to do full justice to a meal that only happens once a year. William, said Barbara pleasantly, I can dream. Can you? He made no answer. Answer your cousin, William, said his mother. He swallowed, then spoke plaintively. You always say not to talk with my mouth full, he said. You could speak when you've finished the mouthful. No cause I want to fill it again then, said William, firmly. Dear, dear, murmured Aunt Jane. This was Aunt Jane's usual contribution to any conversation. He looked coldly at the three pairs of horrified aunt's eyes around him, then placidly continued his meal. Mrs. Brown hastily changed the subject of conversation. The art of combining the duties of mother and hostess is sometimes a difficult one. Christmas afternoon is a time of rest. The three aunts withdrew from public life. Aunt Lucy found a book of sermons in the library and retired to her bedroom with it. It's the next best thing, I think, she said with a sad glance at William. William was beginning definitely to dislike Aunt Lucy. Please, Em, said the cook an hour later. The mincing machines disappeared. Disappeared, said William's mother, raising her hand to her head. Clean gone. How am I to get the supper? You said as how I could get it done this afternoon so as to go to church this evening. I cannot do nothing with the mincing machine gone. I'll come and look. They searched every corner of the kitchen, then William's mother had an idea. William's mother had not been William's mother for eleven years without learning many things. She went wearily up to William's bedroom. William was sitting on the floor. Open beside him was things a boy can do. 
Around him lay various parts of the mincing machine. His face was set and strained in mental and physical effort. He looked up as she entered. It's a funny kind of mincing machine, he said, crushingly. It's not got enough parts. It's made wrong. Do you know, she said, slowly, that we've all been looking for that mincing machine for the last half hour? No, he said without much interest, I didn't. I'd have told you I was mending it if you'd told me you was looking for it. It's wrong, he went on aggrievedly. I cannot make anything with it. Look, it says in my book how to make a model railway signal with parts of a mincing machine. Listen, it says, borrow a mincing machine from your mother. Did you borrow it? said Mrs. Brown. Yes. Well, I've got it, haven't I? I went all the way down to the kitchen for it. Who lent it to you? No one lent it me. I borrowed it. I thought you'd like to see a model railway signal. I thought you'd be interested. Anyone would think anyone would be interested in seeing a railway signal made out of a mincing machine. His tone implied that the dullness of people in general was simply beyond him. And you haven't got a right sort of mincing machine. It's wrong. Its parts are the wrong shape. I've been hammering them, trying to make them right, but they're made wrong. Mrs. Brown was past complaining. Take them all down to the kitchen to cook, she said. She's waiting for them. On the stairs William met Aunt Lucy carrying her volume of sermons. It's not quite the same as the spoken word, William, dear, she said. It hasn't the force. The written word doesn't reach the heart as the spoken word does but I don't want you to worry about it. William walked on as if he had not heard her. It was Aunt Jane who insisted on the little entertainment after tea. I love to hear the dear children recite, she said. I'm sure they all have some little recitation they can say. Barbara arose with shy delight to say her piece. Little brown seed, little brown brother. And what, pray, are you going to be? I'll be a poppy as white as my mother. Oh, Dio be a poppy like me. What, you'll be a sunflower. Oh, how I shall miss you. When you are golden and high, but I'll send all the bees up to kiss you. Little brown brother, goodbye. She sat down blushing, amid loud applause. Next Jimmy was dragged from his corner. He stood up as one prepared for the worst, shut his eyes, and... Little acts of kindness, little deeds of love. Make this earthen Eden like the heaven above, that's all I know. He gasped all in one breath and sat down panting. This was greeted with slightly milder applause. Now, William, I don't know any, he said. Oh, you do, said his mother. Say the one you learnt at school last term. Stand up, dear, and speak clearly. Slowly William rose to his feet. It was the good ship Hesperus that sailed the wintry sea. He began. Here he stopped, coughed, cleared his throat, 
and began again. It was the good ship Hesperus that sailed the wintry sea. Oh, get on, muttered his brother, irritably. I cannot get on if you keep talking to me, said William, sternly. How can I get on if you keep taking all the time up saying get on? I cannot get on if you're talking, can I? It was the Hesperus that sailed the wintry sea and I'm not going on if Ethel's going to keep giggling. It's not a funny piece, and if she's going on giggling like that I'm not saying any more of it. Ethel. Dear, murmured Mrs. Brown, reproachfully. Ethel turned her chair completely round and left her back only exposed to William's view. He glared at it suspiciously. Now, William dear, continued his mother, begin again and no one shall interrupt you. William again went through the preliminaries of coughing and clearing his throat. It was the good ship Hesperus that sailed the wintry seas. He stopped again, and slowly and carefully straightened his collar and smoothed back the lock of hair which was dangling over his brow. The skipper had brought prompted Aunt Jane, kindly. William turned on her. I was going to say that if you'd left me alone, he said. I was just thinking. I've got to think sometimes. I cannot say off a great long poem like that without stopping to think sometimes, can I? I'll, I'll do a conjuring trick for you instead, he burst out, desperately. I've learnt one from my book. I'll go and get it ready. He went out of the room. Mr. Brown took out his handkerchief and mopped his brow. May I ask, he said patiently, how long this exhibition is to be allowed to continue? Here William returned, his pockets bulging. He held a large handkerchief in his hand. This is a handkerchief, he announced. If anyone would like to feel it to see if it's a real one, they can. Now I want a shilling, he looked round expectantly. But no one moved, or a penny would do, he said, with a slightly disgusted air. Robert threw one across the room. Well, I put the penny into the handkerchief. You can see me do it, cannot you? If anyone wants to come and feel the penny is in the handkerchief, they can. Well, he turned his back on them and took something out of his pocket. After a few contortions he turned round again, holding the handkerchief tightly. Now, you look close, he went over to them and you'll see the shilling, I mean, Penny, he looked scornfully at Robert, has changed to an egg. It's a real egg. If anyone thinks it isn't a real egg. But it was a real egg. It confirmed his statement by giving a resounding crack and sending a shining stream partly onto the carpet and partly onto Aunt Evangeline's black silk knee. A storm of reproaches burst out. First that horrible insect almost wept Aunt Evangeline, and then this messy stuff all over me. It's a good thing I don't live here. One day a year is enough. My nerves. Dear, dear, said Aunt Jane. Fancy taking a new laid egg for that, said Ethel severely. William was pale and indignant. Well, I did just what the book said to do. Look at it. It says, take an egg. 
Conceal it in the pocket. Well, I took an egg and I concealed it in the pocket. Seems to me, he said bitterly, seems to me this book isn't things a boy can do. It's things a boy cannot do. Mr. Brown rose slowly from his chair. You're just about right there, my son. Thank you, he said with elaborate politeness, as he took the book from William's reluctant hands and went over with it to a small cupboard in the wall. In this cupboard reposed an air gun, a bugle, a catapult, and a mouth organ. As he unlocked it to put the book inside, the fleeting glimpse of his confiscated treasures added to the bitterness of William's soul. On Christmas Day, too, while he was still on fire with silent indignation, Aunt Lucy returned from church. The vicar didn't preach, she said. They say that this morning's sermon was beautiful. As I say, I don't want William to reproach himself, but I feel that he has deprived me of a very great treat. Nice William, murmured Jimmy sleepily from his corner. As William undressed that night his gaze fell upon the flower, decorated motto, a busy day is a happy day. It's a story, he said, indignantly. It's just a wicked old story. Rice, mold, said the little girl next door bitterly. Rice, mold. Rice, mold. Every single day. I hate it, don't you? She turned gloomy blue eyes upon William, who was perched perilously on the ivy covered wall. William considered thoughtfully. Don't know, he said. I just eat it. I never thought about it. It's hateful, just hateful. Ooh, I've had it at dinner and I'll have it at supper, bet you anything. I say, you are going to have a party tonight, aren't you? William nodded carelessly. Are you going to be there? Me, ejaculated William in a tone of amused surprise. I should think so. You don't think they could have it without me, do you? Huh, not much. She gazed at him enviously. You are lucky. I expect you'll have a lovely supper, not rice mould, bitterly. Rather, said William with an air of superiority. What are you going to have to eat at your party? Oh, everything, said William vaguely. Cream milk pudding? Heaps of it, buckets of it. The little girl next door clasped her hands. Oh, just think of it. You're eating cream milk pudding and me eating rice, mold. It is impossible to convey in print the intense scorn and hatred which the little girl next door could compress into the two syllables. Here an idea struck William. What time do you have supper? Seven. Well, now... If you'll be in your summer house at half past, I'll bring you some cream milk pudding. Truly I will. The little girl's face beamed with pleasure. Will you? Will you really? You won't forget. Not me. I'll be there. I'll slip away from our show on the quiet with it. Oh, how lovely. I'll be thinking of it every minute. Don't forget. Goodbye. She blew him a kiss and flitted daintily into the house.
William blushed furiously at the blown kiss and descended from his precarious perch. He went to the library where his grown-up sister Ethel and his elder brother Robert were standing on ladders at opposite ends of the room, engaged in hanging up festoons of ivy and holly across the wall. There was to be dancing in the library after supper. William's mother watched them from a safe position on the floor. Look here, mother, began William. Am I or am I not coming to the party tonight? William's mother sighed. For goodness sake, William, don't open that discussion again. For the tenth time today, you are not. But why not? he persisted. I only want to know why not. That's all I want to know. It looks a bit funny, doesn't it, to give a party and leave out your only son, at least, with a glance at Robert, and a slight concession to accuracy to leave out one of your only two sons? It looks a bit queer, surely. That's all I'm thinking of how it will look. A bit higher your end, said Ethel. Yes, that's better, said William's mother. It's a young folks party, went on William, warming to his subject. I heard you tell Aunt Jane it was a young folks party. Well, I'm young, aren't I? I'm eleven. Do you want me any younger? You aren't ashamed of folks seeing me, are you? I'm not deformed or anything. That's right. Put the nail in there, Ethel. Just a bit higher. That's right. Perhaps you're afraid of what I'll eat, went on William bitterly. Well, everyone eats, don't they? They've got to to live. And you've got things for us them to eat tonight. You don't grudge me just a bit of supper, do you? You'd think it was less trouble for me to have my bit of supper with you all, than in a separate room. That's all I'm thinking of the trouble. William's sister turned round on her ladder and faced the room. Cannot anyone, she said desperately, stop that child talking? William's brother began to descend his ladder. I think I can, he said grimly. But William had thrown dignity to the winds and fled. He went down the hall to the kitchen, where Cook hastily put herself between him and the table that was laden with cakes and jellies and other delicacies. Now, Master William, she said sharply, you clear out of here. I don't want any of your things, Cook, said William, magnificently but untruthfully. I only came to see how you were getting on. That's all I came for. We're getting on very well indeed, thank you, Master William, she said with sarcastic politeness, but nothing for you till tomorrow, when we can see how much they've left. She returned to her task of cutting sandwiches. William, from a respectful distance, surveyed the table with its enticing burden. Her, he ejaculated bitterly, think of them sitting and stuffing, and stuffing, and stuffing away at our food all night. I don't suppose they'll leave much not if I know the set that lives round here. Don't judge them all by yourself, Master William, said Cook unkindly keeping a watchful eye upon him. Here, Emma, put that rice mould away in the pantry. It's for tomorrow's lunch. 
Rice mold. That reminded him. Cook, he said sweetly. Are you going to make cream milk pudding? I am not, Master William, she said firmly. Well, he said, with a short laugh, it'll be a queer party without cream milk pudding. I've never heard of a party without cream milk pudding. They'll think it's a bit funny. No one ever gives a party round here without cream milk pudding. Don't they indeed, Master William, said Cook, with ironic interest. No. You'll be making one, perhaps, later on just a little one, won't you? And why should I? Well, I'd like to think they had a cream milk pudding. I think they'd enjoy it. That's all I'm thinking of. Oh, is it? Well, it's your ma that tells me what to make and pays me for it, not you. This was a novel idea to William. He thought deeply. Look here, he said at last, if I gave you, he paused for effect, then brought out the startling offer sixpence, would you make a cream milk pudding? I'd want to see your sixpence first, said Cook, with a wink at Emma. William retired upstairs to his bedroom and counted out his money tuppence was all he possessed. He had expended the enormous sum of a shilling the day before on a grass snake. It had died in the night. He must get a cream milk pudding somehow. His reputation in the eyes of the little girl next door a reputation very dear to him depended on it. And if Cook would do it for sixpence, he must find sixpence. By fair means or foul it must be done. He'd tried fair means, and there only remained foul. He went softly downstairs to the dining room, where, upon the mantel piece, reposed the missionary box. He'd tell someone next day, or put it back, or something. Anyway, People did worse things than that in the pictures. With a knife from the table he extracted the contents three halfpence. He glared at it fiercely. Three halfpence, he said aloud in righteous indignation. This supposed to be a Christian house, and three halfpence is all they can give to the poor heathen they can spend pounds and pounds on, he glanced round the room and saw a pyramid of pears on the sideboard tons of pears and an green stuff to put on the walls, and they give three halfpence to the poor heathen. Ha! Huh. He opened the door and heard his sister's voice from the library. He's probably in mischief somewhere. He'll be a perfect nuisance all the evening. Mother, couldn't you make him go to bed an hour earlier? William had no doubt as to the subject of the conversation. Make him go to bed early. He'd like to see them. He'd just like to see them. And he'd show them, anyway. Yes, he would show them. Exactly what he would show them and how he would show them, he was not as yet very clear. He looked round the room again. There was nothing to eat in it so far except the piled up plate of huge pears on the sideboard. He looked at it longingly. They'd probably counted them and knew just how many there ought to be mean sort of thing they would do, and they'd be in counting them every other minute just to see if he'd taken one. Well, he was going to score off somebody, somehow. Make him go to bed early indeed. 
He stood with knit brows, deep in thought, then his face cleared and he smiled. He'd got it. For the next five minutes he munched the delicious pears, but, at the end, the piled-up pyramid was apparently exactly as he found it, not a pear gone, only on the inner side of each pear, the side that didn't show, was a huge semicircular bite. William wiped his mouth with his coat sleeve. They were jolly good pears and a blissful vision came to him of the faces of the guests as they took the pears, of the faces of his father and mother and Robert and Ethel. Oh, crumbs! He chuckled to himself as he went down to the kitchen again. I say, cook, could you make a small one quite a small one for threepence, halfpenny? Cook laughed. I was only pulling your leg, Master William. I've got one made and locked up in the larder. That's all right, said William. I wanted them to have a cream milk pudding, that's all. Oh, they'll have it all right. They won't leave much for you. I only made one. Did you say locked in the larder? said William carelessly. It must be a bother for you to lock the larder door each time you go in. Oh, no trouble, Master William. Thank you, said Cook sarcastically. There's more than the cream milk pudding there. There's pies and cakes and other things. I'm thinking of the last party your ma gave. William had the grace to blush. On that occasion William and a friend had spent the hour before supper in the larder, and supper had to be postponed while fresh provisions were beaten up from any and every quarter. William had passed a troubled night and spent the next day in bed. Oh, then. That was a long time ago. I was only a kid then. Umph, grunted Cook. Then, relenting, well, if there's any cream milk pudding left I'll bring it up to you in bed. Now that's a promise. Here, Emma, put these sandwiches in the larder. Here's the key. Now mind you lock it after you. Cook. Just come here for a minute. It was the voice of William's mother from the library. William's heart rose. With Cook away from the scene of action great things might happen. Emma took the dish of sandwiches, unlocked the pantry door, and entered. There was a crash of crockery from the back kitchen. Emma fled out leaving the door unlocked. After she had picked up several broken plates, which had unaccountably slipped from the shelves, she returned and locked the pantry door. William, in the darkness within, heaved a sigh of relief. He was in, anyway. How he was going to get out he wasn't quite sure. He stood for a few minutes in rapt admiration of his own cleverness. He'd scored off Cook. Crumbs. He'd scored off Cook. So far, at any rate. The first thing to do was to find the cream milk pudding. He found it at last and sat down with it on the bread pan to consider his next step. Suddenly he became aware of two green eyes staring at him in the darkness. The cat was in two. Crumbs. The cat was in two. The cat, recognizing its old enemy, set up a vindictive wail. William grew cold with fright. The rotten old cat was going to give the show away. Here. 
Pussy. Good old pussy, he whispered hoarsely. Nice old pussy. Good old pussy. The cat gazed at him in surprise. This form of address from William was unusual. Good old pussy, went on William feverishly. Shut up, then. Here's some nice milk pudding. Just have a bit. Go on, have a bit and shut up. He put the dish down on the larder floor before the cat, and the cat, after a few preliminary licks, decided that it was good. William sat watching for a bit. Then he came to the conclusion that it was no use wasting time, and began to sample the plates around him. He ate a whole jelly, and then took four sandwiches off each plate, and four cakes and pies off each plate. He had learnt wisdom since the last party. Meanwhile, the cat licked away at the cream milk pudding with every evidence of satisfaction. It even began to purr, and as its satisfaction increased so did the purr. It possessed a peculiar penetrating purr. Cook called out Emma from the kitchen. Cook came out of the library where she was assisting with the festoon hanging. What's the matter? There's a funny buzzing noise in the larder. Well, go in and see what it is. It's probably a wasp, that's all. Emma approached with the key, and William, clasping the milk pudding to his bosom, withdrew behind the door, slipping off his shoes in readiness for action. Poor puss, said Emma, opening the door and meeting the cat's green gaze. Did it get shut up in the nasty dark larder, then? Who did it, then? She was bending down with her back to William, stroking the cat in the doorway. William seized his chance. He dashed past her and up the stairs in stockinged feet like a flash of lightning. But Emma, leaning over the cat, had seen a dark flying figure out of the corner of her eye. She set up a scream. Out of the library came William's mother, William's sister, William's brother, and Cook. A burglar in the larder, gasped Emma. I saw him, I did. Out of the corner of my eye, like, and when I looked up he wasn't there no more. Flitting up the hall like a shadow, he was. Oh, my goodness. It's fairly turned me inside. Oh, my goodness. What rubbish, said William's mother. Emma, you must control yourself. I went into the larder myself, ma'am, said Cook indignantly, just before I came in to help with the greenery ornaments, and it was empty as air. It's all that silly Emma. Always having the jumps, she is. Where's William? said William's mother with sudden suspicion. William. William came out of his bedroom and looked down the stairs. Yes, mother, he said, with that wondering innocence of voice and look which he had brought to a fine art and which proved one of his greatest assets in times of stress and strain. What are you doing? Just reading quietly in my room, mother. Oh, for heaven's sake don't disturb him, then, said William's sister. It's those silly books you read, Emma. You're always imagining things. If you'd read the ones I recommend, instead of the foolish ones you will get hold of. 
William's mother was safely mounted on one of her favorite hobby horses. William withdrew to his room and carefully concealed the cream milk pudding beneath his bed. He then waited till he heard the guests arrive and exchange greetings in the hall. William, listening with his door open, carefully committed to memory the voice and manner of his sister's greeting to her friends. That would come in useful later on, probably. No weapon of offence against the world in general and his own family in particular was to be despised. He held a rehearsal in his room when the guests were all safely assembled in the drawing room. Oh, how are you, Mrs. Green, he said in a high voice, meant to represent the feminine voice. And how's the darling baby? Such a duck. I'm dying to see him again. Oh, Delia, darling, there you are. So glad you could come. What a perfect darling of a dress, my dear. I know whose heart you'll break in that. Oh, Mr. Thompson. Here William languished, bridled, and looked around in a fashion seen nowhere on earth except in his imitations of his sister when engaged in conversation with one of the male sex. If reproduced at the right moment, it was guaranteed to drive her to frenzy. I'm so glad to see you. Yes, of course I really am. I wouldn't say it if I wasn't. The drawing room door opened and a chatter of conversation and a rustling of dresses arose from the hall. Oh, crumbs. They were going in to supper. Yes, the dining room door closed. The coast was clear. William took out the rather battered looking delicacy from under the bed and considered it thoughtfully. The dish was big and awkwardly shaped. He must find something that would go under his coat better than that. He couldn't march through the hall and out of the front door, bearing a cream milk pudding, naked and unashamed and the back door through the kitchen was impossible. With infinite care but little success as far as the shape of the milk pudding was concerned, he removed it from its dish onto his soap dish. He forgot, in the excitement of the moment, to remove the soap, but, after all, it was only a small piece. The soap Dish was decidedly too small for it, but, clasped to William's bosom inside his coat, it could be partly supported by his arm outside. He descended the stairs cautiously. He tip-toed lightly past the dining room door, which was slightly ajar, from which came the shrill, noisy, meaningless, conversation of the grown-ups. He was just about to open the front door when there came the sound of a key turning in the lock. William's heart sank. He had forgotten the fact that his father generally returned from his office about this time. William's father came into the hall and glanced at his youngest offspring suspiciously. Hello, he said. Where are you going? William cleared his throat nervously. Me? He questioned lightly. Oh, I was just just going a little walk up the road before I went to bed. That's all I was going to do, father. Flop. A large segment of the cream milk pudding had disintegrated itself from the fast, melting mass, and, evading William's encircling arm, 
had fallen onto the floor at his feet. With praiseworthy presence of mind, William promptly stepped onto it and covered it with his feet. William's father turned round quickly from the stand where he was replacing his walking stick. What was that? William looked round the hall absently. What, father? William's father now fastened his eyes upon William's person. What have you got under your coat? Where? said William with apparent surprise. Then, looking down at the damp bulge under his coat, as if he noticed it for the first time, oh, that, with a mirthless smile. Do you mean that? Oh, that's just just something I'm taking out with me, that's all. Again William's father grunted. Well, he said, if you're going for this walk up the road why on earth don't you go, instead of standing as if you'd lost the use of your feet? William's father was hanging up his overcoat with his back to William, and the front door was open. William wanted no second bidding. He darted out of the door and down the drive, but he was just in time to hear the thud of a falling body, and to hear a muttered curse as the head of the house entered the dining room feet first on a long slide of some white, sticky substance. Oh, crumbs, gasped William as he ran. The little girl next door was sitting in the summer house, armed with a spoon, when William arrived. His precious burden had now saturated his shirt and was striking cold and damp on his chest. He drew it from his coat and displayed it proudly. It had certainly lost its pristine, white, rounded appearance. The marks of the cat's licks were very evident. Grime from William's coat adhered to its surface. It wobbled limply over the soap dish, but the little girl's eyes sparkled as she saw it. Oh, William, I never thought you really would. Oh, you are wonderful. And I had it. What? Rice, mold for supper. But I didn't mind, because I thought I hoped you'd come with it. Oh, William. You are a nice boy. William glowed with pride. William bellowed an irate voice from William's front door. William knew that voice. It was the voice of the male parent who has stood all his jolly well going to stand from that kid, and is out for vengeance. They'd got to the pears. Oh, crumbs. They'd got to the pears, and even the thought of punishment to come could not dull for William the bliss of that vision. Oh, William, said the little girl next door sadly, they're calling you. Will you have to go? Not me, said William earnestly. I'm not going not till they fetch me. Here. You begin. I don't want any. I've had lots of things. You eat it all. Her face radiant with anticipation, the little girl took up her spoon. William leant back in a superior, benevolent manner and watched the smile freeze upon her face and her look of ecstasy change to one of fury. With a horrible suspicion at his heart, he seized the spoon she had dropped and took a mouthful himself. He had brought the rice, mold by mistake, 